my, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. This is what compels me to compel them. And I will do it by whatever means necessary. Welcome to the Black Girls Heal podcast, where we talk about healing our intimacy disorders, unresolved trauma, and building a healthy relationship with first ourselves and then others. Every episode, we will talk about advice you can apply today to break unhealthy patterns and grow in your self-worth. I'm Sheena Lachey, Love Addiction Coach and Trauma Specialist. Let's begin. Hello, hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Black Girls Heal. So on today's episode, we're going to jump right on in today. On today's episode, we are talking about a really important topic, and it is the topic of being a married single mother. So I've had different episodes that have talked about this experience, either in part or a symptom of it, or or invited some of you to share your story about what it's been like for you. But we haven't had an episode that focused on it in full. And the experience of being in a partnership where you are taken for granted, um, dismissed, neglected, and abused. And so we are going to talk about why that word abuse is being used here. When often, when you look at the experience of being a married single mother, while it does exist that there is physical abuse in some cases for many women, they are in a relationship where they are slowly drowning and losing themselves and feeling depressed and anxious and getting sick and um, really lost. But they have never had a hand laid on them. And they start to wonder, is this me? Am I the problem? Is there something that I'm missing? Is there something that I can do to repair this partnership and make it better? Is there a way that I can grow? Is there a tool? Is there a therapist? Is there a next step that I might be missing? Is there a prayer? Is there a religious figure? Is there something that can help restore what I thought that this relationship would be? And for people who are in this experience of being a married single mother, they are with partners that do not have all the qualities to to be that, but but it's easy to, to not be able to see that. Thanks for listening to this week's podcast. Before we get started, let's take a small break to say thank you to this week's sponsors. So you've heard me share about my journey with vitamin D and how a deficiency was causing havoc in my life, causing depression that was not helped by therapy, emotional support skills, and other resources that I had access to because the source was organic and coming from inside my body. And it was only by healing my body with vitamin D supplements that I actually saw change. And I'm not alone with me being part of the 82% of black women in America who struggle with the vitamin D deficiency due to our melanin not being able to synthesize as much vitamin D from the sun. But Black Girl Vitamins is a proud black owned brand that develops vitamins to address the specific needs of black women like iron and vitamin D deficiency. Each purchase contributes to a scholarship fund that supports black women pursuing healthcare education. Plus they're vegan friendly and free Free from harmful additives. Try Black Girl Vitamins to see improved health in areas such as energy, fertility, and pregnancy support, balancing your blood sugar, and more. Get 10% off your first order with the code HEAL10 at blackgirlvitamins.co. That's B-L-A-C-K-G-I-R-L-V-I-T-A-M-I-N-S dot co and use promo code HEAL10 to get $10 off. Take control of your health and level up your summer with Black Girl Vitamins. It's time to make this summer your healthiest one yet because of what all the stories that were told. So I'm kind of getting into what we're going to talk about today. Um, so I will save save more about what a married single mother is and, and what that looks like for my conversation with our guest who's going to be talking about her experience there. But, you know, right now I am going through some of the foundational things that I teach here, right? So we've talked about love addiction. And then there was an episode that talked about one of the experiences of love addiction. Then we talked about love deprivation. And this is absolutely one of those experiences. So 
the slow dismantling of yourself, of your identity and what you want and who you are happens in these relationships. And so for those who are either currently going through it, for people who have already gone through it and have left, for those who are in a, a healthy marriage or at least in a marriage with a partner that is not abusive, is not emotionally neglectful, you know, imperfect as all humans, but not experiencing this, but you have a friend that may be going through this, this is also for you to hear. And for those who are single and who do want to be in partnership, you know, I, I think that this journey is one that no one sees going into it until they're on the other side of it. Meaning that you may believe that you are fully aware of what is happening and what your red flags are and what the non-negotiables are. But for this issue, unless you actually have connection to someone else's story and to see what the slow burn and again, the slow dismissal and deconstruction looks like, you will miss it. So again, if you are one of my listeners who are single and you do eventually want to be in partnership, or even if you don't, because some of y'all are like, I, I put off relationships and then one day you do want a relationship. This is not the type of partnership that I want you to mistakenly fall into and think that the reason why this is so easy is because you've met the right person versus is very easy to repeat this type of trauma and this type of adult relationship without realizing it until you're too deep in. So we're going to be talking about that today. Um, have an amazing guest who's going to be sharing her story, Jasmine Chanel, who is full-time a marketing and brand coach, but on her platform, she has been talking about her experience as a married single mother. And I was like, our audience needs to hear that. So I'm going to share a little bit more at the end of this episode. So make sure you stay tuned for that. But um, there, I will say right now, there is something that I said about covert narcissism that I'm going to take back, but I'm going to say more about that at the end of the episode. So stay tuned, but here's our episode. All right. So today on the podcast, I have someone I am a big fan of, Miss Jasmine Chanel. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Sheena. Excited to be here. Yes, yes. So we go way back um, through business and coaching, which you're going to talk about and tell us about yourself. But you are here to talk about a very specific topic that is so important for so many women, so many women who are struggling and need the support. And so I'm so happy that you're here. And so we're talking about being a merry single mother. Yes. And um, I'm so grateful that you're here to share your journey of recovery and growth and how that looked for you. Yeah, I'm you. excited to talk about it. So thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah. So here, every time I have a guest, I have them introduce themselves. So can you tell our audience about you? Yes. So my name is Jasmine Chanel. I am a mother of three and the owner of the Mom to Mogul brand. So I really built a business around helping women transition out of corporate America and finding freedom through entrepreneurship and helping them do it with little ones at home. You know, so it has been a fun journey um, just connecting with people on the Internet and helping guide them in that way. Yes, yes. And so you have been um, a godsend for many of us learning how to not feel like we have to choose between knowing ourselves and loving ourselves and, and living in our talents and our purpose while also building families and building mm -hmm. connections with other people. You've been a really great model for that. Um, and now you've been a very great model for what it looks like when life evolves past that, yeah. right? So, so let's talk about that. That's been something that you've been talking a lot on your platform. So tell me about what it's like, or actually how this, what made you decide to make this a part of your platform? And then also how would you describe being a married single mother? Yeah. So I realized I had shared everything else and there was no way around also sharing transitioning out of my marriage and transitioning into um, single motherhood. And so I thought, you know, if I'm just as loud and bold about entrepreneurship, I'm loud and bold about being a stay at home mom and homeschooling and all the other things that I was kind of documenting in my life. Um, there has to be a way that I can share this as well. And I realized that it was something that I didn't see anybody else talking about. 
Um, no one was talking about what it felt like to be a married single mom. No one was talking about when you reach this pinnacle of what looks like success and it doesn't feel good to you, what happens next? And so I kind of started to kind of peel back the layers to start sharing that because I didn't want people to feel like they were the only one. And I know when I was going through my transition, I felt like I was the only one experiencing this. And so when we talk about being a married single mom, it's essentially the woman who is in a long term partnership or married and she's doing a lot of the emotional labor in the relationship, but also a lot of the parenting. And so she's doing all of the household tasks, all of the child rearing, all of the raising, you know, all of the making suggestions of the podcast we should listen to to work on the marriage. Um, and it gets exhausting. It gets really exhausting. You feel like you don't even have a partner. And I think I feel like this is also an audience that's suffering in silence because nobody's checking on the married mom, especially the married mom that looks successful. Um, everybody's checking on the single mom because they know she needs help. Um, and they may check, be checking on, you know, people who don't have kids yet or are not in long term partnership yet. The single woman, but the married single mom is kind of lost in the number. And so I wanted to kind of start talking about this topic so that those women didn't feel like they had to suffer in silence. Yeah, when this is such an important point, when I think about married women or married moms, you're so right, because the assumption is that one, your partner is going to be that place of support for you, right? And two, to go with this topic, the assumption is, well, marriage has a um, a common level of struggle, right? right? Like to be married means that it's not going to be all butterflies and rainbows and you're not going to be in forever honeymoon. So I don't know if this was your experience, but almost feeling like you don't have a right to complain or right. that you're being too weak or you're not being strong enough or you're being selfish, right? Mm -hmm. um, and thinking that the valleys that you're going through are temporary. And as long as you keep trying and as long as you keep going, then it's going to change. But that's not the case. Yeah, that was definitely my experience. And, and people just kept saying, oh, marriage is hard. No one can give me con concrete points to validate is this borderline abuse that I'm experiencing or, you know, if it's something more, especially when it comes to like mental, psychological, emotional abuse. If you're not being cheated on or physically abused, you're kind of just lost in the shuffle of things and people are telling you, oh, this is hard. You guys have reached the five year, the seven year, whatever. Um, this is just a part of the process. And then on top of that, having two under two during a pandemic was a new level of stress that I think. A lot of people couldn't even give me any advice anyway because they thought it was the toddlers. They thought it was the pandemic. There are so many things that I was pointing to that were external to the relationship that I thought was causing the stress and the pain of the, the dynamic. Mm -hmm. You use the word abuse and mm -hmm. that's a very significant word, right? And you also use it in parallel to wasn't being hit, weren't being, well, you didn't say not called out your name, but you weren't being right. abused in what we think of as abuse, right? Um, tell me, why did you use that word? I'm very intentional in that, in the messaging, especially as someone who, you know, words mean things to me as a brand coach, as a marketer by trade, words mean things. And I think we have to stop sweeping under the rug that this is almost, you know, just as damaging, if not more, um, because there's nothing you can point to. And I think, I, I said to a friend very candidly in a conversation, I wish he would have just hit me because it would have been easier to explain to people why I was leaving. There's no tangible thing that I can point to um, to explain to people why I was leaving. So I looked like, you know, for lack of a better phrase, the crazy person for walking away from what looked like a good marriage. Um, so I've been very intentional in my language and sharing this in content is because I want women to wake up and realize that this is a form of abuse. Um, it is toxic. It is unhealthy for you. And there's a level of this is dangerous um, for you. I don't want them to be caught up in like, oh, you know, this is something that we can grow out of. In most situations, this is that you're in danger um, and it's going to take a lot of time to unweave and unwrap. And I think in being in my healing process, seeing how long it's taken to even get to the decision, heal beyond it, be able to finally talk about it, all of the things that come, you know, through that up and down of healing. I realized like, no, we're going to call this what it is and what it means to the people that, you know, it affects, it means to them. Right, right. You use the word danger too, and I'm going to jump in. I might jump in here. I might jump yeah, in yeah. a little bit later, but danger is another um, mm -hmm. really significant word, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a clear message, but it's a powerful one. It's, um, it's not one that's easy to overlook. So what is some of the danger, and you can speak to yourself personally, danger that you experience or a danger that you see the women that have been in your circle have experienced as a result of this? Yeah. 
So being a married single mom, the first thing I believe it puts in danger is your assignment here on earth. You know, no matter what your faith background is, I believe that we're all assigned, you know, a specific path that we're supposed to follow. And I think being the married single mom leaves you so burnt out, so exhausted that your calling is in danger. You know, who you're supposed to help, who you're supposed to affect, even if you're a teacher, you know, how you operate in the classroom, um, it puts that in danger. In addition to that, it puts your motherhood in danger because you are battling the gaslighting, the manipulation, all of these things, but still trying to be of sound mind to take care of your children. You're still trying to, you know, break generational cycles. You're still trying to conscious parent and these things just can't happen in tandem um, because it's so heavy to try to carry and mask all of these things. And so those are the two things I think it puts in danger, your calling and your motherhood, how you're able to show up in motherhood um, that makes it almost for me like a fire alarm, like tell everybody quickly because generations will be impacted. And I think generations before were impacted, um, but I think for our generation specifically, we have you know, a bigger duty to kind of work these things out and figure this out um, before it goes on to the next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to add two more places of danger. I'm going to add physical health Mm -hmm. so that we all know, and this is proven, and we all know because we experience it daily, the impact of stress on your body literally gives us immune um, deficiencies. It affects us Cardi um, have with cardiological issues. It affects gastrointestinal issues. Like it literally will shut down your body to be in fight mode all of the time and never have rest. And when you are actually in a relationship as a married single mother, not a relationship that does have the dips and valleys that a committed relationship has, right? They're usually in a committed relationship where there's the problems that typically comes up, there's a reprieve, right? You're in a partnership with someone who actually cares about how you feel. They actually attend to you. They may take ownership of what they have done. They are able to take care of themselves. There is companionship, right? Not perfection, but that they actually see you as a person and not as a tool. But when you are a married single wo- um, woman or mother or, or wife, you are just there to, um, you're like dismissed and rejected and, and put down and used in all ways um, and it's continual. And then, like you said, the gaslighting and everything, it really does um, adjust or affect your health. And I've just seen so many women literally die, literally die early deaths. And when you look at their lifestyle and you look at the things that were going on, the high amount of stress, the lack of help, the lack of support, um, when you look at the way that their partners treated them or didn't treat them, Um, And what happened, there's a direct correlation, but these are also women that just thought, well, this is just life and life is hard. And, you know, God will get me through if they're a woman of faith or I I heard someone say the other day, they had a partner who the wife kept saying, this isn't working for me. I need to, I need this to change. I need you to show up. And he didn't actually think that she was going to leave until she left. And when he was interviewed, he said, well, I thought it was a tolerable level of unhappiness. Like I knew that she wasn't happy. It's not even that he didn't know. He just thought, well, she ain't going to go nowhere. Right. And I think that is true for so many people to the point of, you know, your mission, your platform that we don't go, that we all want to have the fairy tale. We see the people who are in marriages who have overcome so much, you know, even Michelle Obama has famously said there was like 10 years of her marriage that she hated Barack. Right. And who wants to miss out on Barack? Right. Like who wants to miss out on on their honeymoon and like the fun and everything. So you, you see these examples and you think, okay, well, that's what this is. But the person that you're with does not have the qualities of yeah. these other partners, right? Who do have the self accountability, the emotional intelligence, um, the 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 growth, right? Do you mm-hmm. want to say something to that? Yeah, I wanted to add also, and I, I made a reel about this on my social media. The physical things that went away when this man moved out of my house was crazy. Um, I have been working to lose belly fat for forever. Like, if y'all want to lose the mom fupa. <laughs> <laughs> that part, like, so the high cord is all love. I was holding on to belly fat, insomnia, panic attacks, um, heightened heart rate, heart palpitations. Um, I thought I had mold poisoning from 2021 through 2022. I thought I had mold poisoning and they're like, nothing's wrong with you. And I kept going to the doctor and even working with my therapist on the insomnia. She's like, take a bubble bath. Don't look at your phone before you go to sleep. And then once we made the transition, I was sleeping like a baby. And we realized there was no amount of interventions that anybody else was doing, the doctor, the holistic stuff I was doing or the therapist that could have taken, you know, helped me improve 
long term if the trigger is still sleeping next to me every night. And so, yes, the physical ailments is a large part of it as well. Yeah. Not only just in the house, but when you're in this type of relationship, there's a sabotage. There's an intentional yeah. sabotage mm-hmm. of growth. Mm-hmm. So all the ways that you may be trying to improve the relationship, whether or not it is counseling, working on yourself, doing all the right communication skills, taking time for yourself, the other person will come in and throw a wrench in because they well, I'm speaking for these people who are not here, but they want to keep things status quo. Yeah. You know, they have it pretty good. They have you at their beck and call. They, in these types of relationships, they don't show up again in partnership. Um, and and to ask you to move and to get better, that means that they may lose something and they don't yeah. want that to happen. Um, which makes me think of the second thing that I wanted to share, which is uh, as far as the dangers, the emotional danger, the emotional and mental health impact. So, you know, earlier you said the word abuse, right? And it wasn't Mm -hmm. physical abuse, but there are other types of abuse. And one thing that is common with every single person who has ever listened to this podcast and got something from any person I've ever talked to about anything, the common denominator for all of them is emotional neglect as a significant trauma. Mm -hmm. If they grew up in the Cosby show with you know multiple six figures and millions of dollars and everything was great on paper they can all point to they needed attention love connection and emotional safety just for being them and affirmed and not having that has caused significant issues in their self-esteem and their ability to function in the world the self-doubt and what they do and what they don't do and the relationships that they choose and the relationships that they push away right and so in a relationship as a married single mother or a married single wife if your partner doesn't have to be um, categorically a narcissist Right. But if they are in their avoidance, significantly neglectful and abandoning and rejecting you and using you, that definitely impacts your psyche and impacts yeah. your ability to function. Yeah. And I and I the reason I started to explore deeper is because it was affecting me in my business. I was achieving a high level of success. The business was the most successful it had ever been, um, but I was sabotaging it the whole way. And then as I was helping client reach certain, you know, business milestone, money milestones, they were having the same issues happening. I'm like, what, what is it? What is it about us <laughs> that's causing this to happen? And it was, we share a lot of the similar traits and we, we're in very similar types of relationships, friendships, mother, daughter dynamics, um, mother, father dynamics. And, and it was something that I'm like, okay, once I figure this out, I need to talk about this just like I talk about helping people make six figures a year because I thought this was way more important than any of the other things I ever shared. Right. right. So I know that we've talked, you know, about the definition in general and some of the things that have happened, but um, I've seen you share so many great lives. By the way, y'all, we're going to share her socials at the end. Um, and she has some amazing lives. I talk about this more in detail, but in s- several of the lives you've talked about qualities of unhealthy relationship. Like, Mm -hmm. how can you know that this is what's happening? So if you can talk about those, or even if you feel open, specific things that were happening in your relationship to tell you that there was something going wrong. Yeah. So one of them is if you have a high level of personal integrity, but you find yourself lying to your partner, that was always really hard for me because I'm honest. I'm the person that if you left two pennies on accident in my car, I'm going to give you back your two pennies. And so I was finding myself hiding my successes, hiding how much the business actually made, you know, lying about small things, wanting to go see friends, but lying about, oh, I'm going to a meeting because it only had to be work, you know, for me to get permission to go in so many words. And so if you find that you have a high level of self integrity, but you're lying to the person, um, if you find that you have to walk on eggshells and predict somebody's emotional reaction to something and you're policing your behavior, that may be a sign of unhealthy marriage or unbalanced marriage, um, even policing the behaviors of your kids. And so I think for me, that is where it, the straw, you know, that broke the camel's back is I realized I was holding them back don't be too loud, you know, so-and-so is working on this, don't do this, you know, um, they're going to be mad about this. And so policing my kids' behaviors where I realized that, oh no, it doesn't make sense for me to stay here because I'm not going to police them for the the rest of their lives. And then also because I was already a very free-flowing parent, that was something that was a value of mine. And so I was working really hard on conscious parenting and giving them autonomy and it just did not match up um, with the partner that I was with. Um, One really good example is if you feel mom guilt for things that you shouldn't feel guilty about. Um, so changing the schedule, 
if it's something to improve you, you're delegating laundry. If you feel guilty about spending an extra $10 or $20 a week to let delegate laundry, when this person is spending money on way more things that are not useful to the household, those are like some very specific examples. Another one is sabotage. So if you do go away, say you take a stand and you just decide you're going to go on mom vacations, that's something I decided to do. I'm going to go away for a weekend as mom. I'm staying in the hotel by myself. I'm going to trust that this person can keep the kids alive, feed them everything. It doesn't have to be perfect, but they're going to feed them. If I come back and my entire house is trash for me being away for 48 hours, that may be a sign that you're in an unhealthy dynamic because you're getting punished for things that you shouldn't be punished for. It's very subtle. And that's why I've been very open about sharing very specific examples, because no one in a million years could have taught, told me that that was psychological abuse. It's just like, oh, men don't know how to do things with kids. Your kids are little. This is not the age where they help out that much. All of those things keep women stuck and suffering in silence and not being able to recognize what they're actually living in. And once I was able to transition out and look back at, because I record so much content and look back at the last three years and like, oh my gosh, I had no idea what I was living in. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. You know, the hiding things really stands out to me and is so connected to everything else that you shared. So when you think about the coercion and manipulation that happens again in these relationships, when there's not a person that's a narcissist or physically abusive, but they're just a regular guy, right? The nice guy, which we should probably talk about too. Um, but when they're just a regular Joe, um, and they're not calling you out your name, they're not cussing you out. The way that the coercion can look is the emotional wearing you down. Yeah. So a suggestion or a conversation turns into this super long, you know, drawn out, emotionally draining thing. And so you learn over time to just stop asking, yes. to stop suggesting, to stop wanting, to stop needing. And, you know, it was really interesting because this happens to all women. It happens with women who, you know, can are usually very strong and very opinionated. So you think you get into these types of relationships thinking, I'm going to stand up for myself and I'm not going to like let this happen. And so you don't notice the slow degrading of your voice and of your boundaries. And that is just easier sometimes to just take care of it yourself with the kids, or it's easier to just not even ask or, you know, wait till later, wait till they're in a good mood. Yes. You know, there's not a threat of being physically hurt, but there's definitely the threat of you being told that um, is not the right time or um, just a look even yeah. that's like, why, what are you talking about? Like, you're, why are you so needy dumb. and why is it why so, are you so needy? <laughs> so, yeah. All of that. Right. Yeah. And it's like, is it? And because, you know, I talk often about all the things that we want to work on or that may be issues that actually are superpowers. So to be a generous partner is a good thing. To be a partner that's willing to compromise and learn and listen to what may, what the boundaries are of the person you're with, those are all superpowers. But when you're with someone who takes advantage of that and there's it's always you compromising, right? They're, they don't come back to your side. They don't come to your side unless there is a punishment, unless there is a quid pro quo, unless you have to pay them back somehow. Um, right. That's how you know you're not in a normal relationship because you are always the one that's coming down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 And then I wanted to say when it comes to the kids, you know, just, you know, being a mother as well is in these types of relationships, what I've seen through clients and personal experience and all that other stuff is, is very interesting how a person who is not actually involved in the parenting has a whole lot of decision, has a whole lot of opinions (laughs) about what it looks like. Yes. Right? <laughs> and I didn't again, realize that and so therapy right. how much opinions I was going to her to try to like am I crazy bouncing off the therapy and she's like you asked me a lot of things about parenting yeah <laughs> yeah but the goalpost is moot is moved so mm-hmm. again you being a partner that wants to compromise and meet them where they are and say well I'm not the only person here you know let's make this cohesive the the goal is for them to break you down or the goal is for them to never be satisfied. So even if you take suggestions, even if you meet their boundaries, yeah. there's always going to be a complaint after that. And that's the mental warfare that makes this very hard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And even in the transition, I think, and I'm learning more about this, is that you'll police yourself even out, after you're out of it, even after just out of habit. Yeah. It's from, it's, yeah. you know, being a long part of the process. And learning to trust yourself again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you look back, I made the comment, good guy, you know, and, I, and I've said this a lot. I was talking about different mm-hmm. 
qualities related to this on like a podcast or a YouTube video. And someone commented or a few people commented, actually, they were like, they sound like a covert narcissist. And the thing about being in these types of relationships is even if there are some narcissistic things like the manipulation and the gaslighting, they don't always meet all the qualities. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is so important because if you're in these situations and you're doing the research and you're going to a therapist and you're doing all the things and you're trying to figure out, is it me or is it them? And you look up narcissism and they're not there, then you're like, okay, well then maybe it is me versus (laughs) sometimes, sometimes these um, abusive patterns can come in the form of a nice person. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I think on paper, no one would have ever believed some of the things that are happening in my house and the in the conversations. And I think that's that was made made me so bold about the message is that it doesn't look how you would expect it. Like even if you spent years in the most intimate moments, I still would have missed it. And I was living it. You know, there's just a few subtle things. It was a very I call it quiet. It's a quiet, toxic is what I would describe it to my, as my friends now. It's like, it's a very quiet toxicity that nobody would have guessed that you would have missed, you know? And it looks like suggestions. It looks like they're trying to help you. It looks like they're making your life easier and you're the difficult one. And so it's very, it's much harder to leave in these situations as well because nobody believes that this super nice person that they've gotten to know over the years as your partner is doing these manipulations if you describe what is happening, um, no one would believe it. It just it just doesn't connect. Um, there's a very specific example when my AirPods would go missing. And as a stay-at-home mom in a pandemic, I like I needed those AirPods. Like I needed if I was on a drug, um, just because of the overstimulation and all. And so I remember very specifically there was a time my AirPods and they would go missing all the time, and I just always assumed it was the kids. And there was a time that they're missing. And I was like so upset about it. I was close to tears. And I was like, can you just please help me find these AirPods? Our, the place was small. Like, I know they're in here. We don't leave the house. It's the pandemic. The AirPods are in here. And we're looking. And this person is helping me search. And I'm looking and we're searching and we can't find the AirPods. And I just finally just broke down. I'm just like, and I was like, are you really crying about AirPods? And I'm like, it's not the AirPods. It's like, I don't have anything in this space that belongs to me. This is the only way I can keep my cool with them, with the kids. And the AirPods turn up 24 hours later, say, see, I told you you need to keep them in this particular spot. You wouldn't lose them so much if you kept them on the counter, whatever. But they have purposely moved the AirPods. And I processed that thing in therapy for like three weeks. (laughs) And I'm like, Mm -hmm. I asked, why can't I get over it? What is it? And she's like, no, your boundaries were crossed. Um, you know, you don't feel heard. And now this person is purposely, but to anybody else, I told that story. There's like, oh, your spouse is playing a joke on you. It's a prank. And it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. And so those are the subtleties when it's the nice guy, no voice. We never argued, you know, there were no arguments that I could point to. There was no voice raising that I could point to either, but the nice guy, um, is a nice guy for a reason. It fits the narrative where they're able to do whatever they want. You still look like the villain at the end of the day, um, no matter how sound of a mind that you're in. Hey, we hope you're enjoying the podcast so far. Let's take a quick break to say thanks to this week's sponsors. Ladies, I am so excited to share that for this podcast episode, I've partnered with eHarmony, the dating app that helps people find real genuine connection. And for me, this app has absolutely held true to their promise, connecting me to a truly incredible relationship and partnership with someone who truly gets me. Dating apps can be so hard when it comes to filtering through persons who you may not have anything in common with or who may not be super serious about the process and committed. With eHarmony's one-of-a-kind compatibility quiz, you get a baseline standard in every match of your compatibility around values, communication styles, likes and dislikes, energy levels, and so much more. My experience with eHarmony has always been superb with not only the quality of men I was matched with, but also with our compatibility when dating, eliminating the stress of feeling as if I was wasting my time. So join the dating app that helps users find their most authentic relationships. eHarmony, get who gets you and start free today. Yeah. 
Yeah, to other people and to yourself. Again, you know, when I heard that example at first before I found out that he was intentionally do it, doing it, the first thing that was like when he was like, well, I told you you should have done that, like the talking down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In some context, some people will call that out and be like, oh, that's a narcissistic tactic and depend is always depending on the crowd. Some other people be like, well, you know, men are not as emotionally soft. Like he might just be really direct, you know? And like a lot of things when I talk about on this podcast is we're not just looking at the moments, we're looking at a pattern. Yes. And if this is how it is continually, again, without reprieve, that's where we need to pay attention to it. So you already talked about what was the turning point, or at least I think you did when you talked about seeing how it was affecting your children. How did you start to make your way out? What did that look like? What were the resources that you used? Yeah, so I had started therapy in 2020, um, thinking that I had postpartum anxiety is what I was trying to work through. And I thought, oh, motherhood is just overwhelming me. So I never considered divorce. It was not in the things that I was going to therapy to heal from. Uh, I was really working on postpartum anxiety. And how I made the connection, like I said, is because I felt like I started to police the behavior of my kids. And so what I actually started was a self-love journey and therapy and so I again I wasn't looking for divorce help I wasn't expecting him to go to counseling or anything I just started taking myself out going on my momcations where I go on a vacation by myself I was doing those once a quarter and when I was be on those momcations I miss my kids but I never miss my partner I was never in a rush to go home and I oftentimes was like I could just take the kids with me but I couldn't explain I want to take a family vacation without you and just take the kids um and so that was a turning point for me. And so I worked on the self-love, the self-healing. I rebuilt my spiritual toolbox from the ground up. And it was like, God, you have to tell me what to do next because I don't know what this looks like. I don't know what should I, I should be expecting. Um, and then I went to a conference in June of 2022. Last year, it's been a year. And I just saw so many couples at that conference. It was the Black Equity Conference in Miami. And there were so many couples in that conference that were on the same page. Like I could tell by the questions they were asking. It was like all about investments and, you know, business and things. And I'm like, that's what a partnership looks like. And I remember inviting him to come and he didn't want to come. And I went, I remember going by myself and it was just so many couples there that it was a confirmation. I'm like, no, what I want is out here. And there's no reason to just keep waiting for what I have at home to kind of change when I've asked for change. Yeah. So I went to the conference and I saw that all of these couples were, I saw true partnership in real time. And when I came back, I'm like, Hey, I don't think this relationship is working for me. I had already gone through for the year, you know, prior asking him to go to marriage counseling, things like that, that wasn't working. And within a week of me having that conversation, he started going to church twice a week. He is uh, setting up the marriage counseling for us. He's helping with the kids, his friends and family are calling me about how he's such a good person and all these different things. And I think he thought it was going to make me change my mind or make me happy. It actually made me angry because you knew the entire time what I needed for you to do, for you to show up, and you pretended like you could not do doing it. And so to me, that was like, oh, no, I'm never going back. That was, the, that was the end of it. And so that's kind of how I made the transition. Now, I did start to plan financially before I ever had the conversation. That's been the bulk of what I've been talking about in my content on socials, like, Yes, we may want to leave tomorrow once this light bulb comes on, but be strategic, <laughs> be very strategic in how you make the transition and saving the money, you know, preparing. What does it look like? What are my non-negotiables in divorce? What do I want custody to kind of look like? You know, being prepared for the worst and best case scenario is started the process. Yeah, I can relate to the self-love journey being the catalyst mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because once you start you know, being in this type of relationship, that slow degradation, right, of who you are, your identity, you don't under, you don't notice where the sadness and stuff is coming from. Like it just, it feels like it's just life, especially, you know, for you during the pandemic, right? It's like, it's just yeah. like part of normal, typical stress. And so similar to you, starting to take care of myself. And I can say this with words now, but I didn't have it back then. I started to remember who I was and I started mm -hmm. to have wants again. 
I'd always had once, but I just figured, you know, that's not the partner I'm with, or, you know, maybe later, or, you know, I can put it off or find it in different ways, but I'm going to stop expecting it from here, right? Um, And just could have stayed in that same relationship forever, actually. Um, Again, I think many of us, we haven't talked about this, many of us have generations before who have been so unhappy or have been in struggle relationships for so long. And again, the normalization of marriage being hard in the culture. So you just think this is how it is. So you just buckle down um, for the long term, not realizing that your relationship to your point is different than with other people's, right? Um, other people go through crap, but their partner is bringing something different. Um, I actually that said that. I actually said yeah. I would have stayed until my youngest was 18 years old. So I would have been there another 15 years. Mm, mm-hmm. If I didn't so realize what, it was affecting the children. Oh, if it wasn't affecting the children, you would have stayed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so for me, it was, I was like, Okay, this is I I'll have these wants, I have these needs. So I went to my partner and I was my partner at the time and I was like, um, these are the accommodations, like this is what I need to like be happy. And they were small, you know, like again, basic minimum standard things, you know? And it was just such that person was not open to them. And very similar to once I was actually out the door, then it was like, oh, I'll, I'll do anything. And I'm like, actually you won't. And actually, even with those things, they don't do it for a long period of time because it's not, is another manipulation tactic is also like a saving face so that they can go and tell other people, you know, I've I've done everything I can and they weren't open. But meanwhile, you know, you watch, you listen to any, any marriage therapist who's ever done couples therapy, they all say that when it comes to couples therapy, whenever a man is calling to do the couples therapy, they will talk about being blindsided. They will talk about how this has, they had no idea. But when you actually sit and talk to the couple, this woman has been telling them for years, yeah. something is wrong. Like they have been communicating and 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 begging and pleading, right? Yes. And so um, it really is um, a shut up, you know, right now I've seen a lot of trends about women getting shut up rings. Like you're in this long-term relationship with someone for a long period of time and you're wanting commitment, you're wanting something more stable and you're putting pressure on them and they give you a ring to shut you up. That doesn't mean that they actually love you. It doesn't mean that they're actually going to be committed or be a good partner, but you know, you're just pressuring them. And so this is going to buy them some more time. And so that's what couples therapy can be in this case. That's what a meeting with your pastor can be in this case. That's what, you know, them, I don't know, having a date night with you can be, but it's not coming from them. It's because you pressured them, you threatened them. Um, It's not because they actually care about you being happy. They don't care about you as a person Mm -hmm. um, and about your heart. It's probably if we want to bring this all down to one really core thing is like, does this person actually like you and and care about you as a person? And that's huge, right? That's huge. And I I realized that I'm like, he doesn't like me for real. (laughs) Yeah. does not like me for real um, multiple times I love you but I don't like you and here I am so we were together 12 years 12 years in and it was such a normal thing but it was a joke you know it was the, it was the going joke but once I was out of the relationship I was like yeah they they tell exactly what they're thinking yeah they, they tell you exactly what they're thinking. And you, again, in hindsight, you can see all the signs, all the things you excuse. And that's so powerful that I love you, but I don't like you. You know, I think, especially if you grow up with childhood emotional neglect or not being seen as for a person, it's so easy to get in those relationships because you don't know what it's like to actually be enjoyed, to actually truly be someone's friend. And there's a difference between you being able to be in a room and just like, you know, make way versus actually truly, truly enjoying each other and being friends. And it primes us. It primes us to be in relationships with people that were there out of obligation, out of yeah. duty, because we're a caretaker, because that's what we've done our whole life. Or we yeah. watch other people do that whole thing. So we don't really clue in that something's wrong unless we're actually starting to pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you talked about what you did to transition out and what were some of the resources that you had? What has it been like since you've made that transition? It has been amazing. (laughs) It has been amazing. And I know people think women are being facetious when they say it that way. But once you find your freedom again, once you see yourself again for who you truly are, it's like a, it's like a rebirth. It's a whole 
new life. Now, that doesn't mean custody court is not hard because I'm still actively in this process. Our divorce, we've been in this process now for 12 months, still no final hearing date in sight. But um, you just learn to navigate this new parts of you. And then even the way my kids have blossomed, the way my motherhood journey looks, it's totally different. My goal is always freedom. My number one value is always freedom. And now I have the freedom to parent them the way that I always thought made the most sense. And, you know, we can go to Disney World on a Tuesday because they're homeschooled and I don't have a job. There's a not a third person I have to check with that would keep us from having these experiences um, that we would have before. And then I've gotten to know myself on a whole new level, like what I'm truly made of, you know, what I'm able to figure out on my own, um, how, how much value I do truly bring to a relationship or partnership in general. Um, those have been the most eye-opening parts of the journey. And so I think the biggest thing I want to leave with people is that your kids will be okay. It doesn't have to look perfect. Some of them, the decisions you have to make may be a little all over the place. You won't know each next bullet point that you're going to check off. But ultimately, you being in a health, healthier and happier place will trickle down in your motherhood as well. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most surprising things that people feel um, mm -hmm. when it comes to making the transition out is how happy they feel. Yeah. Like you might feel like, well, I have to do this. Right. But until you actually have that mantle lifted and you're like, you can breathe again. And then, especially if you have other people, you know, I've talked about on the podcast or like expecting you to be sad and forlorn and you're like, I'm about to throw a party. Like, you don't understand <laughs> like the freedom that's here. Right. And like, to your point, the kids feel it, the kids notice it. And you're really sharing a message of, of, of liberation. And also yeah. what it does it look like to actually love and everything when, you know, when I would, for me, I thought my child wasn't at an age yet to where I could see that effect physically, mm -hmm. but I was thinking this example is what he's going to see. Yeah. And this is not the type of relationship I want for him. Mm -hmm. This is not what I want him to think is acceptable. I do not want him to see his mommy sad, depressed, um, and just being a workhorse because I watched that in the relationships that came before me. I had lots of models and I know how that turns out. Right. right. And so I was like, this is where, this is where the, the generational curse ends. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's worked out, you know, same thing. Happy as I've ever been the best relationships I've ever been in, you know, once I came back to me and learned that lesson, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think the, the previous generation part too is what keeps us so scared because they're so afraid of single motherhood because obviously they experienced the struggle of it. Um, and what I had to explain to the women in my family, because my grandma was a single mother, my mom was a single mother, a lot of my aunts are, what I had to explain with them is that I get to choose what this looks like. It doesn't have to be the struggle version of motherhood. I get to choose what happens next. Y'all don't have to be worried about me. They were so worried that they were advising me to stay in something that was unhealthy. And I'm like, no, that's not what we're doing. So even watching my daughter run around, when you talk about the workhorse part, that's how she would run around the house at three. And I'm like, no. And I remember my son saying something one time, like, no, daddy doesn't have to help you with that. That's that's for girls to do. And so we had never had these very gendered conversations in my house. It wasn't something we talked about, but they were picking it up just by right. watching. And so those were the little small things. I'm like, no, this is this is gonna need to look different. Yep, yep, yep. So speaking of motherhood, I know we're about to both tap into our mom shift. So we have to go on my you one last question before we tell the audience where they can find you to learn more. Um, you know, you mentioned that you save, try to save financially ahead mm -hmm. of time. However, I'm going to share this just because I've heard you share publicly on your platform. Um, when you left, though, you did not have thousands saved and you, you had a very little amount. I'll let you share whatever you want to share. But I want to talk about this because I think there are so many people who, no matter what they feel, they are afraid of the financial loss mm -hmm. and feeling like they're not at a place to where they could be comfortable. And I don't know if that's always yeah. necessary. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, I was a saver already and frugal. Uh, but if the person that you're with, you think you know them and they say they're going to help out and they're going to continue to help out no matter what the relationship looks like. And then that goes away. You'll burn through your savings pretty quickly. And so I started the year this year with negative $43 in my bank account. And I've been very transparent in sharing that too, because it's like, it doesn't matter what it looks like on paper, what it looks like online. Nobody chooses to be in these situations and you really get to see what 
you're made of after you come out of it. And so my advice for those women who feel afraid is to just like really start to prepare as much as possible, but also think of the worst case scenario. As long as you have a way to feed yourself and you have some shelter, a place where your kids to stay, look at it as a boomerang. And that is exactly what happened this year. I started with negative 43. I'm like, okay, I'm going back to ground zero. I moved back to my hometown. I cut all of my expenses as low as possible. I stopped chasing him down for money. I'm like, I'm just gonna let the court system do what they need to do. They still haven't done what they needed to do. And so at the end of the day, these children belong to me. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what the judge says. All these other people who like, that's his kids too. When it came down to it, where we were facing eviction, did not have groceries. It was me who had to figure it out. And so if you're afraid of the financial aspect, prepare as much as possible. Um, Lean on your community. You can't have a lot of pride. And I think that was what this season was about, like being able to really tell people what I needed for the first time and really like lean into my community, lean into my village to see who could help and who couldn't. And then I used it as a boomerang. I knew I would not be where I was in January for the rest of this year. And that has been proven over and over, multiple times over. I just needed to stick it out for those couple months to like really trust God with what was going to happen next. Absolutely. Um, for those who are regular listeners of the podcast, there is an episode and I want to say it's called financial abandonment, abandonment as a red flag. And, mm-hmm. you know, we don't have the time to talk most a lot about this right here. Well, that's a good one. It is <laughs> It is very common that in these types of relationships that you are the one who's financially taking care of everything, no matter how much money they bring in or not, that you are the one who's the salt problem solver. You're the one that's the budgeter. You're the one who's overseeing everything. So those same skills are skills that are going to benefit you and help you thrive mm-hmm. after the transition period. Um, that right now, it doesn't matter if you're in this relationship and this is affecting you, it doesn't matter how much you save and how much you budget and how much you invest. Somehow there's, there's never enough if this is the type of partner that you're with. Um, and that changes. Um, (laughs) that that changes. And if you are the breadwinner too. So, and I I did my married single mom masterclass and a lot of them are terrified of this. And once we broke it down, they're already paying 80, most of them 70 to 80% of the bills they're already paying. And so they're terrified of that financial aspect when a lot of the stuff we're already doing, you know, right. that goes back to the psychological abuse of it, thinking that you're incapable. Yep. Yep. Well, Jasmine, thank you so much. Your story has been very helpful. And I know that there's a lot of women who can relate and I hope that they find inspiration from your vulnerability today. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah. So can you tell the audience where they can find you to learn more? Yeah, so I spend most of my time over on Instagram. So you can follow me at underscore Jasmine Chanel. That's J-A-S-M-I-N-E-C-H-A-N-E-L-L-E. Um, or you can visit www.jasminechanel.com. Awesome. Great. And I just want to plug, I didn't do as good of a plug at the beginning. Jasmine is one of my favorite business coaches. So her program is called Mom to Mogul. And she really does help mothers, whether or not you work full time. Part of her story, again, that we didn't talk about is that she started her business while she was working full time with little ones and started a side hustle that became for her a full time business. But she's helped so many women um, who work full time, who have full lives, create their passion, who are mothers as well. And so um, whether or not you're tuning into her for the Mary Single Mother content, or because you have a passion and you have a full life and you're wondering how do I balance all this Jasmine is your girl and so um, I hope that you get your resources whatever you need from her thank you for the plug you're welcome all right thank you so much so I hope that you enjoy that interview with Jasmine she is a treasure and if you felt connected to her to her story or ways that she can help you even outside of her story. I hope that you look her up because she is truly an inspiration. But I wanted to come back at the end of the episode to just share, you know, this concept is so big and it's so broad. And there are so many things that I wanted to share and that I wanted to hit on and I wanted to ask and I wanted to bring up because the different pockets and ways that this hits your life, that it hits your psyche, that it hits your sense of pride or your confidence, it's, it would take hours and hours and hours to break it all down. And so I, every time I've had an episode that it either mentioned the term married single mother or, or wife, or had 
a topic that focused on what one of the symptoms or experiences look like, I always get emails or get DMs from women saying this is what I'm experiencing right now. So I'm really happy that you talked about it. So I want to invite you that if that is the case for you, that you continue to let me know that this is what you need to hear, that you are letting me know that this is on the right track for you. And let me know what your other questions are. You know, maybe there can be another podcast episode that talks about some of these things, but I'm going to point you in the direction of a few other episodes off the top of my head that may be helpful if this is an experience that you have. Uh, And I already talked about the financial abandonment as a red flag. There is an episode that talks about um, when they humiliate you. That is another one. And then, of course, there's my episode about getting divorced. And I want to say it was like, it's either five lessons I learned from getting divorced or six lessons from getting divorced, one of those. And so you can find all those episodes and anything else that that you may find relation to. I really encourage for you to find the title that speaks to you, listen to it, and take notes and know that that is for you. So I believe... And I know that it is possible to have a healthy relationship. And I know that even in the healthiest of relationships, that there is conflict, that there is trauma, (laughs) that there is miscommunication, that there are moments of boredom, that there are moments of joy, that there are moments of, I can't stand you. But I, even me listening to the podcast over again and listening to the edits and what I wanted to change or what I wanted to keep, especially with like the sound jumps and everything, something that I kept saying that I really wanted to clarify because it's one of the main criticisms that I hear from the culture at large that really shamed me in staying in the place longer than I should have because of how it impacted me in all the places that I've talked about before is... You hear a lot of people say people don't stay together anymore because this generation just wants to be happy all the time and they really just want to feel special. And that's why things are breaking down. And that is not why things are breaking down. Um, We have two women here and there are countless women that I talk to who one thing that they have or one thing that they bring into the relationship is the longevity factor. They bring commitment. They bring the ability to stay in something long-suffering and and for it to be long-suffering. They have patience. They have self-awareness to look at their parts. So what the problem is, is not people who want to be feel fancy-free and feel like a special angel or snowflake. It's that they're in relationships with that there's real abuse happening. And you can't compare the normal wear and tear and growth and rebirth and learning each other again and dealing with adjustment in a relationship with someone who doesn't see you as a person and someone who um, is committed to not making it work. There's no amount of what you can do, no amount of actions on your side with what you can do that's going to fix that. And so... I know, again, because I get your DMs and I see them, I know how much many of you are torn, but I've also gotten the messages from many of you who have made that step and made that break and you've started to feel that relief. And so one of the things that Jasmine says when she teaches is that she is not pro-divorce and I'm also not pro-divorce, but I am pro not continuing patterns of abuse and not allowing yourself to be a willing martyr because there is no prize for suffering. There is no prize at the end of the day for you internalizing that and being a model of that for your children and for your friends and for everybody else that comes after you, except for more of the same. And what I am passionate about when it comes to this corner of what I teach here is you knowing that what you're feeling and what you're needing is healthy, that it is reasonable, 
that you are deserving of it. And there will be some partnerships where you can bring your concerns and bring your needs to the person that you are in relationship with. And there will be growth. It may be hard. It may be um, unsteady for a while. There may be a lot of bumps and, and nicks and things along the way, but there will be transformation. And for some of us, there will not be. And I really encourage everyone to live in the reality of what's happening. And for some of us, the reality is being able to see a person for exactly who they are. Sometimes the reality is looking at the fact that we are coming with our own biases and our own projections and we're pushing people away who want to love us and who are available to love us. And so the reality is not more reasons to be avoidant, but it's actually more reasons to move towards them. And so you're the only one who knows if you are, if you're in a partnership and you're like really listening to this, you're the only one who knows which side that is. And I really encourage you, encourage you to do your research and do your, do the next steps that you need to, to figure out which one of those lanes applies to you, applies to your life, and then run it full out. And, and know that as long as you are chasing health and growth and, and emotional safety and security and getting out of a cycle of trauma, that you're on the right track. So uh, the thing that I wanted to take back <laughs> at the beginning is the part about covert narcissism. So, you know, up until the time I recorded this, I swore up and down that, and you heard me say it, I swore up and down that covert narcissism was not part of my own personal experience. And then with some of the things that we shared, I was like, wait a minute. So I went and I did my Googles again. And y'all, I swear that the qualities looked different <laughs> than what I thought it was before. And so I kept that part in and I didn't want to adjust that just because, you know, that's also part of this journey too, which is learning things and having those aha moments and being like, oh, that's what I thought it was, but it was actually something else. Um, and getting that information. I still want to maintain that I don't think that every single person who has this experience is with someone who is a covert narcissist. But if you are, that is a term for you to explore and look up to see how that fits for you. Um, and in that respect, the covert narcissist in, in relation to the nice guy looks like a nice, unassuming, almost passive person who kind of goes along with a lot of things. They may be really good at talking about their emotions and how they feel, and they may feel some self-doubt in some areas, and you get to be the person who's there to believe in them when nobody else believes in them. You get to be the one to be different than the people who came before you. You get to be the one who sees this person with so much potential and you almost feel lucky that you have someone that is so, so endearing in that way. But there are some other things afoot as well. And so I say that again, because I think that there are, not everybody is with the big bad wolf who is huffing and puffing and blowing your house down. Some of you are with some, some, some highly potent, but some very passive predators or if it helps you hear this message better, people who are more laid back but have some predatory behaviors. And you get to decide if you are going to stay in the lion's den or not. So I'm going to stay I'm in there again. You know, <laughs> I'm over an hour now. This is so easy for me to talk about. There are so many different types of relationships that I see women in this community get into. This is just one of many, um, but it's one that I'm just as passionate as helping people find freedom in or find freedom from. So that's it. I'm done for real now. I will see y'all in our next episode. I'm sending you so much love and just know that you are worth it. Take care of yourselves.